I think we went to the wrong Spider-Verse. There were entirely too many spiders, and not the Spider-Man kind. Uh, <laughs> did you say some raid with you? <laughs> uh, no, not enough, but I escaped anyway. Any ca- anyways, welcome to Under the Bridge, everybody. Welcome to Under the Bridge. I'm Cody, a.k.a. the Scarlet Troll. And I am Greg, a.k.a. Greg. And we are back with more news about movies and comics and not really games, but something gaming adjacent, which I'm going to just jump into now. Alrighty. This weekend, I was fortunate enough to see a documentary called Token Taverns. It is about some Florida barcades, most of which are in the Tampa Bay-ish area, being in Dunedin, Clearwater, and Tampa, but one of which was in Fort Lauderdale as well. And it was just a really cool look at what the scene was like prior to, during, and then after the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. And usually, I'm not much of a documentary person. They bore the piss out of me. But Mm. this one, I had a really good time. It was really engaging. And I say that as somebody where you'd assume, okay, yeah, he plays games, so of course. I'm actually not super into barcades, though, because I'm not actually a huge arcade fan, because they are loud and there's a bunch of people. But, <laughs> and I also don't drink enough for bars to be worth it, but... <laughs> Double fare. <laughs> no, I like this one a lot. So, it, because it's a, obviously, not big studio movie, it's independent, I think they're still working on getting a streaming situation sorted out, I'm not 100% on that. But because of okay. that, I did just want to shout out, say I had a great time watching it. You can find them on Facebook and Twitter, and I'll actually post links in the description for this week. So, yeah, check them out. And if you're interested in this sort of thing, make sure to follow, make sure to help spread it around, because it's a cool concept. Oh, yeah. Because it was a documentary, I didn't feel like doing a full review, so... Yeah, that's that's fair, that's fair. I mean, like, I, I unfortunately wasn't able to make it, but it was one where I was keenly interested in it, because like you, I, I'm not big into arcade cabinets or that scene, but it goes without saying that a lot of that kind of scene and those games and whatnot directly influence how games are now and how we interact with them nowadays. So when I heard it was a documentary, it was one of those things where I was upset that I couldn't see it, but I'm definitely happy Mm. to hear that apparently it was a very good one. Yeah, no, I had a really good time watching it, and most documentaries have me checking my phone all the time. This one did not. (laughs) Yeah, there's there's unfortunately... Some documentaries get the balance of being factual but being entertaining, right? Most understandably go for the factual part, but that tends to be a bit boring sometimes. So it's good to hear... There I run into the one-two problem of one of my big problems with documentaries is most of them don't necessarily feel all that factual anyway. Oh, uh, fair. <laughs> but, you know, that's a that's a me thing. That's just personal mm-hmm. taste. This one caught my interest, though, so I really wanted to shout it out, which I have. Ex- excellent, excellent. And that's Token Taverns. Yeah. Thank you for the reaffirmation of the name that I forgot to do. <laughs> Token Taverns. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, hey, if you if nothing else, my bad singing will help the listeners remember it. <laughs> true, true. I got a little tiny baby bit of pretty much nothing, but hmm. I'm I'm gonna go on this tangent a little bit anyway. Marvel has confirmed that this autumn we're seeing the return of the Superior Spider Man, written by Dan Slott, as the original was. Okay. God, I, f- I hate that. <laughs> it's like, okay, so it's coming back with the same writer and, and all that. So it's like, alrighty? <laughs> so for those not in the know, Superior Spider-Man was a bit back in, I want to say, 2014-ish, where Doc Ock successfully managed to take over Peter Parker's body. Oh, wait, was this part of the whole thing that Marvel was doing at the time where various superheroes turned evil? No, this wasn't Axis related. Okay, because I remember the whole like Superior Iron Man thing. Oh God, I hate the fact that I, <laughs> I, I hate that I know exactly what event you're talking about. But no, it was nothing related to Axis. Completely okay. unrelated. Doc Ock was dying, so he decided to basically implant a imprint of his consciousness onto Spider Man's mind and overwhelm Peter Parker and took control of his body but was also likewise overwhelmed by getting all of Peter's memories and experiencing his heroism and was like, I could be a hero. Hell, I could be a better hero. I'll be the superior Spider-Man. 
Oh, and no. <laughs> the run ends with a good affirmation of why Doc Ock was always doomed to fail and why Peter is ultimately the true superior Spider-Man. My main problem with the run is that, A, it requires literally everybody in Peter's life to be an absolute moron who can't tell that he's being... Something is wrong. Something is very obviously wrong. Mm-hmm. And two, because Dan Slott thrives on a no such thing as bad publicity and there was a pretty controversial cover and I think it was issue two that had the superior Spider-Man kissing Mary Jane and her looking very taken aback and apparently Doc Ock was going to try really hard to sleep with Mary Jane but ultimately so- <laughs> he decided not to <laughs> but the fact that it was being played up was just gross. Oh, God almighty. Hold on, I've got to look this up real quick. Yep, all right. Because it's like, now I'm curious. Oh, oh my. Yeah. <laughs> that's bad. You can that's see really why bad. I'm not eager to have that back. <laughs> yeah, that's completely fair. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, Superior Spider-Man has proven decently popular. And by mm-hmm. decently, I mean it was actually a very popular concept. I'm just bitter about it. That's fair. He was part of the Spider-Verse event. He then managed to get away in, like, a cloned, I think, still Peter Parker body and was going around being the superior octopus, but then he made a deal with Mephisto, as spiders tend to do, and... (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And he lost all of that, so I don't know how they're bringing him back, but I guess they're bringing him back. Mm. God. Okay, that sounds bad. (laughs) You never know, maybe maybe without the expectations of Peter's dead-ish and none of his friends and allies are going to be able to tell, maybe this will be better. I mean, all I can hope for is that it's not as, for lack of better, like, description, sexually problematic. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> Actually, I think that Superior Octopus bit first happened during Secret Empire, a.k.a. Captain America is a Nazi. Oh, that's... I feel like that's a lot worse. I think Ock was working with Hydra, but ultimately he just like, exploited their resources to get himself a new, better body. I feel like, the, considering how Superior, and em- what, what did you say, or Secret Empire went? Yeah. I feel like that's worse. <laughs> uh, not, not great. Not great all around. Mm. And now it's time for our new segment, you know the one. Do-do-do-do-do-do, pay your fucking riders! Gripping stuff. Absolutely gripping stuff. <laughs> so, we're talking about the rider strike, obviously. Yes. And, per The Hollywood Reporter... Multiple high-level executives who spoke with them on the condition of anonymity used the same word to describe the current strategy of shutting down in-progress productions employed by the Writers Guild of of America. And that word is effective. Okay. So it sounds like they're actively making a dent in stuff Mm. and hurting their pockets, which is good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Apparently, on average, a lost day of production has a cost of between $200,000 and $300,000. Okay, hmm. And if it's caused by a strike, it's not covered by insurance policies. Oh, really? Yeah! Oh, okay, so yeah, that ends up that, that ends up multiplying very quickly, then. Just pay your damn writers! The writers! <laughs> <laughs> My god! I don't know how long it takes to rectify these issues, but it's like, there's just one thing, one thing that needs to happen, and everything will be kosher. I don't know why it's taking this long for that one thing to happen. Well, apparently uh, studios have now started... Circulating incorrect call times and other such things so the writers don't know where to show up and strike or when. Oh, come on. I mean, you know, no, no, I'm not going to even try. Yeah. (laughs) I was going to say, it makes sense because I mean, not necessarily, not necessarily everything that's going on requires writing, but it is still a case of, no, the whole point is to point out just how disruptive it is without having the writers around. So yeah, you know what? Fuck them. Yeah, for real. Just pay your goddamn writers. How much is this subterfuge costing you? (laughs) The answer is yes. (laughs) After a certain point, they somebody has to reverse course on this because otherwise it's going to cost them too much money to not. You'd hope. Yeah, I'd hope. I mean, I feel like I don't know. Part of my brain, maybe it's the naivety in my brain, but part of my brain is just going. It's like, why are we even waiting for the period where it starts costing actual significant amounts of money? There should be efforts, effective, actual, real efforts to reverse it for the sole purpose of you are missing the people that are instrumental to your entire craft and industry. I like how we're talking about before it costs 
significant amounts of money when a, when a shutdown day of production is <laughs> multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, it's like, but like with the that asterisk. That is not there, significant. <laughs> yes, no, with the asterisk. There, I mean, like, yeah, it's one really work, not, though. <laughs> yeah, like one work week is like, oh, million dollars. <laughs> At least. Oh, man. Hmm. It sounds like, and this isn't official yet, but it does sound like the triple threat of a strike with writers, actors, and directors may not be happening, though, because apparently, oh. as mm. of Saturday night, the Directors Guild of America reached a tentative deal for wages, work hours, residuals, and other such things. Okay. Per this new contract, which has not been formalized, or, I don't know the exact terminology, the point is this isn't official, they've agreed upon it, I guess they gotta send it up to somebody, though, mm-hmm. so it could still fall through, I guess. But under this new one, Directors Guild members would see a 5% wage increase in the first year, 4% in the second, and 3.5% in the third year. Assistant directors will have their workday cut by one hour. Live ammunition would be banned on set. (laughs) I hate to laugh. I genuinely hate to laugh, but it's one of those things where it's like, I don't feel like, I feel like that shouldn't even be a requisite. That should just be the standard. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, we've gotten to a point in, like, editing where you can make shit look real. (laughs) Real enough. Mm. All it took was somebody actually getting shot on set. Yeah. And then two years later. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Apparently there's also a clause about artificial intelligence use. That states AI is not a person and generative AI cannot replace the duties performed by members. Okay, the the writing aspect I get. How would AI ha- be a part of directing? Mm, maybe in terms of how something is shot? I don't know. Maybe going, mm. people respond to this better. Fair. Also, apparently, global streaming video on demand residuals will be paid based on number of international subscribers. For, apparently, <laughs> the first time. What the hell? <laughs> <sighs> so this is being submitted to the Guild's National Board on Tuesday. Okay. So we'll see what happens there. The fact that that last part wasn't a thing to begin with is mind-boggling. Right. Jesus Christ. <laughs> just, just pay people. Jesus. Yeah, for, for real. Like, just pay people what they're owed. For making you millions of money. For making you loads of money. Just do it. <laughs> millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Uh... Also, little tiny baby update, it sounds like the strike is impacting work on the latest MCU Spider-Man movie, which, barely anything, who cares, take all the time you need, I can wait for (laughs) Spider-Man. I can wait for just about anything at this point. Right. Get paid. Get paid. God, I can't, I, 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 as happy as I am to have an intro for this segment, I'm very disappointed by how long we might have to have this segment. (laughs) <laughs> oh dear yeah yeah it's not looking good well here's hoping they wrap it up mm-hmm. in a way that is fair to the writers and hopefully fucks over the studios yes because they deserve it <laughs> here's something i didn't know was happening until i found out it had been cast okay live action how to train your dragon really yes but why though i don't <laughs> know Okay. You see, on the one hand, I'm to- I- I'm torn because on the one hand, uh, another live action remake for something that we don't need because it's still a relatively recent thing. I think the when did How to Train Your Dragon three came come out? Hold on. I, I want to say it was like right before the pandemic. Twenty nineteen. So yes, yeah, yeah, yeah yes. And honestly, that one's ending kind of sucked, but um, that's neither here nor there. I would say I still haven't watched it. <laughs> I like most of that movie. I just don't like how it ended. Anyways. Mm. Mason Thames, who was Finny, the main protagonist in The Black Phone, the Mm. one who got kidnapped, not the one with the psychic visions who was trying to help find her brother, right? is going to be Hiccup, and Nico Parker, who has been in HBO as The Last of Us and also was the main girl in the Dumbo movie, the live-action one, that was pretty awful. But not because of her, (laughs) just because, my god, okay, I've been getting on this, I've been getting on this a lot recently, I'm gonna go on a little tangent here. When they said Tim Burton's Dumbo, I thought to myself, hmm, you know what, his over-designed gothic sensibilities could lend themselves quite well to a circus environment, but for the most part, I'm just excited for Tim Burton's Pink Elephants on Parade. And lo and behold, (laughs) wouldn't you fucking know, the Pink Elephants aren't even fucking in it! Mm. There's a little nod to them, and that's it. You had one job! You had one thing in this movie to get right, and you didn't even do it! 
There was but a single callback that was required. Anyway, she's playing Astrid. Okay. <laughs> is where I was is where I was going. Mm. Apparently the film is dated for a release on March 14th, 2025. Okay. On March 14th, 2025, I should say. In March 14th. Or in March 14th. It is going to be physically inside of the day March 14th. It's, I mean, yeah, I guess, technically. <laughs> it's been a long day. Mm, for both of us. Yep. So, yeah, I, I guess we'll follow more on this as we get more info. I... Right, so, uh, the thing that tears me on it, because I was very, I was just very critical of the concept, actually I was just kind of critical of how the franchise ended, but, (laughs) (laughs) the good news is, that was a really gorgeous set of movies, so we already have a pretty good idea for what the dragons might look like if they stick to those designs. They might not, they might make them uglier, who knows, but... (laughs) <laughs> with, with how good those environments looked, especially in the later ones. Mm-hmm. Ah! Good stuff. This can work. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm sure of it. Hypothetically. Hypothetically. On paper. With lots of crayon. With lots, a lot of crayon. <laughs> you a fan of Crayola? <laughs> it's all that AI knows how to use. <laughs> AI, now provided by your toddler. Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh. It was announced on Thursday by Universal Pictures. Dwayne Johnson is going to be back in his own standalone film for The Fast and Furious as Hobbs. Okay, somehow that's actually more disappointing than Hobbs and Shaw too. Yeah, apparently it's going to be the next one. It's going to be the next movie. It's a setup for Fast X Part Two. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh my All god, right. are they actually going to call it Fast Ten Two? <laughs> Final Fantasy Fast 10-2. Ten two. <laughs> I love it. Bring it. Square Enix just has their head popping out of the corners, like Universal. What you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's like y'all want to use the Fast Ten your seat belt, but now we're gonna have a little conversation about copyright. <laughs> yeah. So Vin Diesel, uh, not Vin Diesel. God. So Dwayne Johnson, Dwayne Johnson sent out a tweet. Uh, apparently mm-hmm. he and Vin Diesel put the past behind them last summer. Okay. And he says, we'll leave with brotherhood and resolve and always take care of the franchise characters and fans that we love. I built my career on an audience first mentality and that will always serve as my North Star. Uh, and reading between the, <laughs> reading between say, the lines like, here, uh... I was, re- uh, what I, what I read here, what I translate this as is, uh, <clears throat> I was really expecting to be busy with Black Adam. Hmm. <laughs> And now I'm not. Mm. Anyways. I don't know when Hobbs is supposed to come out. I guess 2024? But... Yeah, cause, yeah, cause when is Fast 11 or Fast 10 2? Oh, I'm just gonna call it that Fast now. 10 2. Uh, that's it. Fast 10. No notes. <laughs> no notes. <laughs> no notes, that's it. It's fast like, and Fantasy 10. <laughs> we are the messengers. That means we need to destroy this Dodge Charger. It's like, I don't think that's how that works, Lightning. <laughs> oh, man. Mm. So I still I, haven't played 10, two, or 10 or 10 two, So Lightning we'll is 13. Later. Or if Lightning is 13, yes, she is. I, I recently played more of 13, and Lightning still confuses me with her idiocy. But nice. that's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd assume this would come out in 2024 if the next one... If, the next Fast 10 is coming out. The next Fast 10 is coming out in 2025. <laughs> but who knows? Okay. There's a strike on, so... That's fair. That's fair. We'll see what... God almighty, uh, this is bad. This is not good optics. Nah, <laughs> nah we'll find out, though. Mm. I got some stuff for The Flash. Oh, no. And it mostly boils down to... The Mushietis really need to shut the fuck up. <laughs> what did they say this time? Well, director Andy Muschietti said... That if there's a Flash sequel, they won't recast Ezra Miller. Uh, isn't that a big reason why the movie's not projected to do well, though? I don't know! Because, okay, that sounds... I'd like to think so, but I feel like your average person on the street wasn't really paying attention to Ezra Miller's rampage through Hawaii and other states. <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know, mm. but apparently he said, I don't think there's anyone that can play that character as well as they did. The other depictions of the I character I don't believe are great, that for a second. But this Sorry. this particular <laughs> vision of the character, they just excelled in doing it. Yeah, this particular vision. <laughs> this, this weird, pr- neurotic, non-brunch understanding dipshit that's not that- Barry Allen at all. Perfect. 
and very problematic outside of being Barry Allen. <laughs> like, I'm s- I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you when you were quoting that, but, nah. but it's like, no, that was just pure reflex. It's like, no, you can't tell me there is not a single other decently handsome mid to late 20s, early 30s white person <laughs> that can that can play The Flash. Ugh. Like, there, there absolutely is. <laughs> oh, and it gets worse. Oh, does it now? While talking with Entertainment Weekly, Andy also said, uh, speaking of the, you know, issues that Miller has been having and the help that they've been pursuing, Mm -hmm. we have a lot of empathy in general for people who need help, and especially in mental health issues. That's why they're taking the necessary steps to deal with their recovery, and we support them in that. Which is nice. That is a good sentiment. We do need to be more supportive of people with mental health issues. 100%. 100%. That is not in dispute. But uh, empathy in general for people who need help. What about the people affected by Ezra Miller's actions? You got any empathy for that? Yeah. Yeah, as I was saying, it's like one of those things, like, do I agree with that sentiment? Wholeheartedly. Is it still really short-sighted given the overall scope of what happened? Very. Did they ever wrap (laughs) up the thing with those people who were missing? I don't know. I don't think- I don't think it ever really came up. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, very. Anyways, I'm very much looking forward to not seeing The Flash- in a in a couple weekends time. Right. Elemental and the blackening baby. <laughs> Gonna be a fun double feature. Mm. Oh man. Oh, and it gets worse. Apparently there is already a completed <laughs> sequel script. Seriously? Yep. The first movie hasn't even come out yet. Yep. What the hell? Man, they must be really banking on this movie doing extremely well. I don't understand. I mean, to be fair, lots of scripts get written, lots of scripts don't get used. So oh, that's fair. That doesn't mean that- anything. Mm. But I feel like they were really banking on this being a billion dollar hit. Yeah, they feel like they're kind of jumping the gun a little Stares bit. Stares at seventy million dollar projected opening weekend. God, I hope so. Yeah, against what? What did you say? To, has it been revealed what this movie's budget is? Allegedly, a hundred and ninety million. Apparently, I don't believe that. No, it's got to be more it's than. It's got to be more than that. Before it was two twenty, and that's what they'd admit. Mm. That's not counting reshoots. Yeah, there had to be reshoots, given everything that was going on. Exactly. Oof, okay. <laughs> huh, so anyways, that's that's a bunch of fun. That's a thing. And now, some Spider-Verse updates. Oh boy. According to Amy Pascal, we could be looking at a live-action Miles Morales movie and an animated Spider-Woman movie. Is I assume the live-action Miles Morales movie would be part of the MCU. Uh... She can't, oh, okay. re- she can't really talk about MCU stuff, I don't think. Mm, fair. So I assume she'd be talking about a live-action Sony-verse, which might be the same Miles from the Spider-Verse movies, or it might not. Hmm. And presumably the animated Spider-Woman movie would be Haley Steinfeld's Gwen Stacy Spider-Woman. Or who knows, mm. maybe it'd be the Spider-Woman we got in Across the Spider-Verse, the new one. Just Drew. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out, I guess, but that's... Mm. God. <laughs> As as much as I like the Spider Verse movies for the most part, I am not looking forward to that ballooning out with things. Yeah, I also enjoy these movies, both the first one, and the second one. The second one we'll talk more about later for what they are. But my thought process, especially with all of the reception that the current one is getting right now, is like, please, oh no, this is gonna turn into some giant ass thing, isn't it? That they're gonna be like, M- so much money, do other things related to get more money, and it's like. Really hoping, I really hope, stays contained to the movies, but I guess that's not happening. We got the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we got the Sony Movie Universe, and we've got the Into the Spider-Verse verse. <laughs> it's verses all the way down, baby! Mm. Huh. Anyway, that's the news that I had. Okay. Let's go to trailer time, and I'm gonna play that intro. <laughs> okay. It's trailer time again! We've got movie previews to watch. It's trailer time again. We got a new trailer for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. And, I mean, I was already sold on the movie, but if anything, it just reaffirmed it. Gonna be completely real, I forgot Ice Cube was in this movie, and I was not expecting him to be the voice of Superfly. (laughs) Right? I mean, there's such (laughs) a huge cast. I had to re-look up that to confirm that Paul Rudd was Mondo Gecko. Oh, is he? Yeah. Because it oh, doesn't okay. sound like him when he just does a people's, they got to go. 
No, I am so excited for this movie. I get more excited the more I see of it. The fact that apparently there's no Shredder this time. Mm. Which, don't get me wrong, I love Shredder in a hypothetical sequel, or threequel, but the Turtles do not always need to face Shredder the first time. It would be It's like how Spider-Man doesn't always need the Green Goblin and Batman doesn't always need the Joker. Yeah. Just because there's the arch doesn't mean they need to be in everything. Yeah, especially since from all I've seen, this movie is very much painting it as being that these guys are very, very green. Yes, I know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> to this I got whole... My, I got my funny to, to, ha- to To this whole crime fighting thing. Like, they're very new to it. <laughs> oh, man. Very green, pun intended. <laughs> that was good. I like that you ratted us out. <laughs> it's like, don't Say that word. I like. I mean, it's 2023, that, Mikey. Yeah, I, when I heard that, it was just like, okay, that's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Our dad's not a giant rat. That kind of makes me think he, he thinks is a rat. Is a rat. Yeah, I get like it's skin. It still looks really good. Again, Ice Cube being the the main antagonist is really cool. Although I think the reference to one of his songs felt a little sounded not great. Oh, in is the that trailer. the? It's six o'clock and there's police at my door. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's that's either a reference to either like one of his songs or a reference to 187 by um Snoop Dogg and and um Big Pun. I see. But either either, either way it's like that didn't sound good. Honestly, as a sh- I'm kind of ashamed to say this when he first started talking I was like I think that's Ice Cube, but I'm not 100% sure and then he, when he goes it's like we're gonna take over the earth. And I was like, yeah, that's Ice Cube. Uh, <laughs> it's like no doubt. But if anything, that makes me significantly more excited for the movie. Yeah, no, I like this a lot. I like what they're going with. I like that it's apparently about them trying to find acceptance. I don't know if it's gonna pan out because the turtles historically, I don't really think get a lot of that. Yeah, I'm not sure how often they've ever really tried though. I mean, to be fair, mm. I'm not a huge turtles enthusiast. I like them conceptually, but I've never, I've never sat through a lot of their media. I just really love the first original live-action movie a lot. Mm-hmm. The Nick show from a while back wasn't that bad either. The Yeah. yeah. I, I don't remember what differentiated it from every other show. I just don't. But in terms of titling, and I don't remember yeah. what year it came out either, so that doesn't help me at all. <laughs> Anyways, the point is, I'm so excited. Raph, you've got a rage problem. It's not a problem! <laughs> <laughs> I saw that, and I was like, I'm pretty sure Cody's going to identify with that pretty good. I, I, I feel attacked. <laughs> I feel as if I've been called out. Mm. Oh, man. No, I'm so excited for this. I should probably oh, yeah. do some kind of poorly explained comics for the Turtles once that's coming out, but to be fair, I don't really know a lot about the Turtles, and I feel like it's kind of disingenuous to pretend that I do, but... Yeah. You know, it wouldn't be the first time I pretended to know more about something than I have. <sighs> Anyways, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Mm-hmm. We also got a trailer for a movie that I'm only interested in because it stars both Jackie Chan and John Cena, and that's Hidden Strike. It looks so bad. It looks so <laughs> awful! It looks so bad. My instant, like, reaction to that, just being like, oh, this doesn't look great to, oh god, this looks bad, was during the wide shot of the very clearly CGI oil tanker in the port. I was just like, Oh, no. <laughs> Everything in this movie is so CGI, I'm not entirely convinced John Cena and Jackie Chan aren't CGI. But I know yeah, they're not. For real. I mean, if I'm honest, the only reason I even have even remote interest in this movie is the banter between John Cena and Jackie Chan. And the use of cartoon stock sound effects from Ugh. the 90s. <laughs> Just the the sound of like him falling through. It was like, eee! <laughs> I was like, all right, we Hanna-Barbera now. Okay, can we talk about the part when that one truck is spewing flames out the back and somehow it makes that tanker flip over? Yeah, what I was, was like... What was that? Okay, as someone who's watched all of the Fast and Furious movies, <laughs> there's no way that jet-powered whatever is creating enough thrust to do that. If that engine produced that much thrust, the truck that it's attached to would also be in the air. <laughs> yeah. Also, I like the bit where John Cena's giving everybody nicknames, and then you get to the one guy who's, like, half tattoos. Yeah. Oh, full disclosure, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> that was funny. I think they, they're going to shoot you. What makes you say that? Because the first time I met you, I wanted to shoot you. It was like, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. 
Yeah, the banter is the main reason I want to see this. I'll agree to that. Otherwise, mm. no interest at all. This looks... Y- y- yeah, this looks good. And this awful. isn't even the worst trailer. <laughs> no, this not at all. This isn't the worst looking thing that we got a trailer for this week, but we'll get to that. <laughs> Let's flip back to something that looks genuinely interesting again, and that is Biosphere. This looks cool. Yeah. It's like, can't really make out what the movie's going for, as far as overall tone, because it seems to switch from being jokey and comedic to being actually depressing and scary. So, overall tone is hard to nail down, but the Which idea of it is- Which I think is intentional. Oh, probably. But the idea, at least the idea shown by the trailer, definitely piques my interest. And of course it's got Sterling K. Brown, who- is just an absolutely phenomenal actor. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Great at what he does. Yeah, I, I'll be honest, it took me minutes when I first saw him. I was like, oh, you're the dude from Honk for Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And I enjoyed him in Honk for Jesus, even though he played an objectively god-awful human being. Great acting, terrible person. Yeah. <laughs> the character, not him. I can't speak to yeah. him as a person. I'm not, I I, I don't know. So, j- just so we're yeah. clear, mad respect for the acting. Yeah, so it's like, okay, that has my interest. Also, I'll I'll confess a little a little thing that might be funny or might not. I put mm-hmm. this on the list because I thought it was a remake of a Pauly Shore movie, which I now understand I was thinking of Biodome. <laughs> so that I saw a buddy comedy movie in the description, and I saw Bio something round, and I thought mm. this is probably a remake of that one movie. Oh, completely unrelated. Okay, cool. <laughs> So that's why that went on here, but I was very pleasantly surprised watching it, Mm -hmm. even though, like I said, the description that I read said it was going to be a buddy comedy, but it doesn't seem all that funny, but it seems like it's funny in a more, like, hitch-in-the-feels kind of way. I got the vibe of, this is going to be a funny in a gets-you-in-the-feels slash morbid joking about these two guys' situation, because from what it sounds like, the Earth is either ending or in the process of ending, and they may actually be, like, the last couple people left. Which is horrifying. And, yeah, and they're trying to, even though they're clearly very good friends, they're trying to figure out, like, how to stay alive during all of this. And I guess we'll see how that pans out. Mm-hmm. Hopefully this gets a wide enough release that I can see it. Yeah. So let's talk about what you brought to class today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about what you, what you brought for show and tell. This thing yes. you have inflicted on me, which well done. <laughs> after after everything, after all the shenanigans I pulled, good on you. Yes, today class, I have decided to bring the trailer for Crack Coon, <laughs> which is Awful. cocaine bear by way of Birdemic, and with a clearly like non-existent production value. Actually, you know what? I don't even want to say by way of Birdemic because Bird Birdemic represents a singularly unique bottom tier of film creation that demands respect mm. if only for sheer audacity. <laughs> this is not that. This is actually more cocaine no. bear by way of Banks killing. <laughs> Basically, I guess there's some new designer brand of crack or whatever that turns you into a murderer, and some guys, in an effort to avoid getting busted with it by the cops, toss it off the side of a road, and a raccoon gets into it, and starts ripping people's guts out. Yes. That's it. (laughs) Uh, Are we gonna get a drug-fueled murder animal cinematic universe? Oh, God. (laughs) We joked about that. Yes, we did. I think you actually joked about there being a, like, drug raccoon movie if i remember correctly i hope like, not right after we saw cocaine bear actually i hope so somebody owes me money <laughs> it's documented i had the idea if i did that <laughs> i'm gonna have to check now i'm gonna i'm gonna have to rewatch cocaine bear and other stuff and so should you mm. everybody listening make sure to rewatch it like comment <laughs> subscribe follow us on spotify <laughs> rss and google podcast <laughs> follow me on twitter please i desperately need the engagement <laughs> That was a good <laughs> middle of show plug. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Now I probably don't have to do one at all at the end. Yeah. No, this looks... This looks so bad. Looks terrible. Is... I hate that you've done this. Well done. Yeah, thank you. You know what's funny about it is that the only reason I found out about it, because I'm subscribed to the movie subreddit, and I saw that, and I was just like, oh, no, is this actually a thing? And I watched it, and it's like, okay, this clearly isn't related to Cocaine Bear, but... God, this is so bad, I can't not mention this to Cody. <laughs> it is, it gives off 
I don't think it's as bad just based on the one trailer. I hope it's not as bad, but I did get mad Birdemic vibes. The only reason why I don't compare it directly is because the actors, whenever they're talking, are actually looking at the other people and not off the side <laughs> of the screen. <laughs> Holy shit, that bugged no, the shit no, out of man. me the first time I saw the movie. Look, honestly, <laughs> Birdemic should not be spoken of in the same breath as this movie. Birdemic <laughs> is is the anti-Zenith. It is the it is the opposite of a peak. It is the Mariner's... What is it called? No, the but- Mariana's Trench of, <laughs> of films. I don't know about opposite of peaks, because I'm pretty sure all the birds in Birdemic had those. Beaks, Greg, not Oh, for beaks. fuck's sake. <laughs> I was so close. <laughs> it was right there. Clip art birds. No, yeah, no. And when I say Birdemic is a uniquely incompetent <laughs> film, I mean that with the deepest affection I can muster. <laughs> I love that movie. I don't mean that with the deepest affection I can muster. <laughs> well, that's why you think Cracoon is anywhere comparable to it. <laughs> if that's fair. Well, yeah, I mean, this looks bad. Birdemic actually made me a little bit angry. <laughs> It made you feel something, as all films should. <laughs> Anyways, that's enough of that. I, I, I look forward to never thinking about Cracktoon ever again. <laughs> Until uh, it comes out in theaters. <laughs> oh god, I don't think it will. I hope it does. Anyways. I, I hope it doesn't. <laughs> let's talk box office. Indeed. We did see the highest grossing movie this weekend, domestically. Oh boy. Because it was Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Alrighty. $120.6 million domestic weekend and total. Jesus. Yep, and it's sitting at $208.5 million worldwide. That's against, I can't fucking believe this, a $100 million budget. <laughs> I don't know if you have this written down or no off the top of your head. What was the Mario movie's opening weekend? Uh, I, fuck, I forget. Um, hmm. a three-day opening weekend of 135.1. I think this is the second highest opening weekend of of the year. Okay. I believe I saw something about that, yes. Okay. I probably should have taken more notes, but I was already anticipating this being a longer episode, so... <laughs> I didn't. All right. Second place, The Little Mermaid. All right. $41.3 million domestically this weekend for a $186.9 million domestic total. It's sitting at $328.1 million in total worldwide. Okay. I think its budget was still like 200 mil, though. Mm. 250, Jesus. Oh, God. <laughs> I guess so, I did. Uh, yeah, fair. Third place, I'm very surprised by this one. The Boogeyman. Okay. Yeah, $12.3 million domestically this weekend and in domestic total. It's sitting at $19.8 million worldwide, but that's against a $35 million budget. 10% of Spider-Verse. <laughs> right? What a Damn. disparity between first and third. Yeah. Fourth place, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Okay. $10.6 million domestic weekend, sitting at $323.1 million domestic total, and $781.8 million worldwide. Pretty sure it's not gonna beat Guardians 2. Mm, okay. But I think it either already has or will beat Guardians 1. Okay. Oh yeah, $773.3 million, so it's already beaten that. And then in fifth place, Fast X! Oh, really? Yeah! $9.5 million domestic weekend for a $128.8 million domestic total, $604.8 million worldwide. So is this the first week without the Mario movie in the top five? I don't think it is. I don't know. Okay. It'll be back. As we discussed, it'll probably be back. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it might be running out of time to be in the box office. Oh, like they've probably stopped like having showings for I it? I think it hits digital not long from now. Oh, okay. Or maybe it already has? And so ends the adventures of Mario Avic and Goose Ouija. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so cursed. Did you see that short? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> oh, man. I'm proud of that mustache I put on him. <laughs> As you should be. And by proud, I mean disgusted. Hmm. So before we get to Across the Spider-Verse, I'm just going to do a relatively short review of the Boogeyman. Mm-hmm. So there's these two kids and their dad. The mom just died not that long ago, and they're still processing grief. And the dad is also a therapist who's helping people with, I don't know, phobias or something? Right. And somebody comes in seeking help, and they claim they're, they've been stalked by some kind of monster. And okay. the monster seems to latch onto the family. <laughs> and they have to deal with that. While also processing grief, because in the same vein as the Babadook and Smile and other such things, this is yet another... 
the monster is a metaphor for grief movie. Hmm. And it's not bad. I was expecting worse. Okay. <laughs> I was expecting significantly worse. I mean, granted, I grade horror on kind of a generous curve, because for me, even bad horror is still relatively entertaining, and middle-of-the-road horror, all it has to do is just give you a few jumps here and there, and that probably does it. Right. And this does that. Mm-hmm. It definitely does that. I actually care about the characters, which is good. Yeah, well, yeah, that's always good. I care about the sisters. I don't care as much about the dad, because while it's clear he's working through his own shit, he also kind of sucks. <laughs> Usually for movies like this, there's at least one sucky human being, so I'm not completely surprised. There's a point where his oldest daughter, the teenager who's in high school, is talking to him about something to do with their mom, and mm -hmm. he says, y your appointment with your doc with your therapist is tomorrow, right? You should talk with that about her. I'm talking to so, you about it. Oh, wait, the, the daughter says that? Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> yeah, no, on the one hand, and he just kind of acknowledges it, but also kind of brushes it off. And it's like, on the one hand, I get it. You don't want to, as a, as a therapist, I assume you don't want to, like, you don't want to treat your own kids. So but I get also, that. But they're also but your they're kids. But they're also your kids. So fucking say <laughs> something, you dipshit. <laughs> Some very rookie mistakes here, uh, going into mm. an obviously haunted place without backup. Oh boy. Yeah, that's that's not smart. There was a point where I had the opportunity to make a throw the cheese reference, I'm quite pleased. There's a weird dream sequence where something is revealed to be a dream, and I was very confused about when it transitioned from the real world to a dream for a bit, and they later clarify it, but it's still kind of a bad transition. Mm. They do a good job properly setting up why the dad is skeptical that there's an actual monster running around. I'll give them props for that. Okay. And you know what? Again, this is probably me being generous. I actually kind of like the monster design here. Hmm. It's a little basic for the most part. Nothing much stands out until you get a detailed look at it going on the attack at the climax of the movie. At which point, it actually does something both horrifying and kind of creative looking, so I'll give it major props there. Okay. All in all, this is nothing spectacular, mm. but it's good enough. Would you say it's worth going to the theaters for? Yes, but I also think matinee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think it's worth a full price ticket for. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. And I think, I think that's about all I got that's not, like, heavy spoilers for it. Hmm. So let's get into Spider-Verse. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Yes, indeedy. The next installment of There's Entirely Too Many Spiders. <laughs> yeah, there are. So, I think we're relatively in the same boat here, mm -hmm. which is good, because I didn't want to be the only asshole going. <laughs> it's mostly great. The majority of the movie is pretty darn good. Yeah, I love the animation as always, the action is great, the music is killer, the plot themes of what they're going for is really creative and really smart and clever. And the emotions are good. The emotional resonance yes. is good. Very. But there's some really big fundamental problems here. Mm-hmm. And I hate, I hate it. I hate, not the movie, but I hate feeling like the killjoy watching everybody else freak out about this going, It's so good! It's even better than the original! And I'm just like, nah, fam, it's not. Because... <laughs> Okay, so it's a year after the first Into the Spider-Verse, after after Brooklyn Spider-Man has been introduced to the being a Spider-Man and a, and a whole verse of spiders. Right. And he is adjusting kind of, sort of, but it seems like his work-life balance is not great. Mm -hmm. And that is causing troubles at home. Not Maybe kind of, sort of, at school, but not really necessarily, but mostly yeah. at home. Because mm. his parents don't know what he's going through because he won't tell them. Yeah. And he misses his interdimensional friends. <laughs> who he then meets back up with trying to stop a supervillain named The Spot. Yes. And gets introduced to an entire society of multiverse protecting spider heroes. And then things start to go askew. They, they go a little bit awry. God, it's hard, it's hard to it's hard to not spoiler this. What can so I say? So, at, 
Actually, I did kind of want to ask you because I didn't ask you about it when we were seeing the movie or after the movie. Okay. Is the spot an established character or is this unique to the movie? No, the spot exists. Okay. I would do a poorly explained comics about him, but honestly, I've got a much funnier idea for next week, I think. (laughs) Alrighty. And then the week after that, I probably need to do something on The Flash just so the algorithm is happy. (laughs) Maybe after, though. No, wait, Secret Invasion is right after that. God, okay. Yes, no, the spot the spot is very much a established Spider-Man villain. He's not typically multiverse related, mm-hmm. but he does still have the whole thing of he can generate portals from the spots on his body. Okay. And also put them on other things. So he's basically an Acme character. He's a walking portal gun. Yeah, he's a walking portal gun. <laughs> okay. An awful lot of making people punch each other or making their punches miss him. <laughs> to be fair, your description of Acme character does fit a little bit better because then I realize, considering what you would imagine someone using that ability for and what he ends up using it for in the movie, him being a walking Acme character does make more sense and is funnier. <laughs> yeah. And I like the first encounter with him and Miles. That's a lot of fun. It's very frantic. It's very... You can tell that Spider-Man is not equipped to deal with this yet. Yeah. Or at least, it's not that he's not equipped, rather. It's that he has no frame of reference for that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What do you do against such a bizarre (laughs) creature? So is that just like a costume, or... Unfortunately for both of us, this is my skin. (laughs) 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 Which was in in one of the trailers, so... (laughs) Fair. (laughs) I didn't take a lot of notes on this one. Mm. It's really hard. Okay, let let me just say in general terms. I like Spider-Man India. Yeah. (laughs) I love Spider-Punk. Yes. Spider-Punk is my favorite, and he better be very prominent in the next one. Yes, because for those who are not aware, did not catch him at home, this is the first part of a two-part series. Which is one of the big problems I have with this movie. But we'll get to that later. No, I mean, we, we could get into it a little bit now. This movie is entirely too long to not have everything wrapped up at the end. Mm. especially the ending. Right. The details I'll get into more, but this movie could have ended like 15 minutes before it did. Right. Because it's already kind of a cliffhanger ending, so if you're gonna go cliffhanger ending, you might... You don't, because that's a (laughs) shitty thing to do. Yeah. But if you're gonna, you might as well go big. Yeah, of course. Okay, well, what I want to say kind of spoils stuff, so we'll get to that It's also very wheel spinny. Yeah... Yeah, no, I feel that, too. And you know what? You know what? Here's another thing I can say, and details will come more later. Part of why I don't like this movie as much as the previous one is that this movie only works if literally hundreds of Spider-Man are behaving antithetically to what it means to be Spider-Man. Hmm. This does not work if any of the characters are acting in character. So for some reason, they are all acting terribly, and I would... <sighs> There's a difficult line to walk here, because it's been pointed out... Some of these some of these are established spiders. Some of them are characters we've seen before in the previous movie, and some hmm. of them are from media where we've seen them, like the Insomniac, PS4 Spider-Man is there. Multiple Spider-Men from animated series are there. Yeah. I know what they're going for. Mm-hmm. There's a very clever thing that they're setting up here that... I'm looking forward to see the resolution of. The fact that I have to wait to see the resolution of it is the problem, and the fact that it necessitates all these characters being total (laughs) dickholes in multiple different ways is just really frustrating as a longtime Spider-Man fan. There's a joke about the spot somewhere in this. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, oh god. (laughs) That took me a second. Anyways, um, the thing I was getting at is, there's an argument to be made that these aren't necessarily exactly the same Spider-Man, like, for example, the one from the PS4 game might not necessarily be this exactly the same one from the games, it might be a variant. Right. However, I submit that that then takes all the impact out of them being in this in the first place. Yeah. If it's not actually these incarnations of the characters, then it's not as impressive. I mean... The only thing I can say about these characters showing up, even though I'm pretty sure it's not actually going to go anywhere and a lot of these show up strictly for fan service, 
it would be neat if there were some actually long-standing implications about all of these other spider characters showing up and being in this universe concurrent with the respective universes that they also come from. Right, and it's especially interesting because for a lot of them, their series or whatever are over. Yeah. Which actually kind of makes it worse. But <laughs> yeah, that's part of the reason why I was like, I don't think they're going to do anything with it. I think a lot of these show up strictly for the sake of fan service. But if they do run with it, there is a lot of potential there. Let's see. What else? What else? I hate Gwen now. <laughs> I was already not fond of her very early into this movie after absolutely yeah. loving her in the previous one because she very quickly puts herself on my shit list. But yeah, she she did something that I think for she did something that for both of us for different reasons, but also for the same reason. She does one small thing, or like, no, <laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> why did I write Spider Man exists in all capital letters? <laughs> huh. Hmm. Oh, also, it doesn't help that w- w- with the whole idea that maybe these aren't necessarily the same incarnations as what we previously seen in video games or TV shows or whatever, it doesn't help that whenever we get a universe designation, they Mm -hmm. are aping the ones from the comics. For example, Spider-Gwen's world is Earth-65. That is her world on the comics. Miles' world is established as Earth-1610. That's the ultimate universe where Miles is originally from. Mm -hmm. So that really does not help. Yeah. You are trying to sell us that these are these concrete iterations of the characters which only makes it more frustrating when they act out of character. Yeah. What else do I like? Mayday. Mayday is great. Yeah, Mayday's pretty good. Mayday's amazing. Peter B. Parker kind of sucks. <laughs> he doesn't... It's not even that he feels... He's not as big of a jerk as everybody else in this, but he also feels, like, dopier. Mm-hmm. Which might just be a result of him no longer being as cynical about shit and lightening up. Part of me kind of went with him being a little bit more derpy. It's like, I think that's just him having a toddler. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, also, I do. As much as I complain about all the spiders being out of character, having this many assembled is pretty great. Oh, it's really great, and they do great things with it, even if that pisses me off. Yeah, no. Just, just because, as one would expect, Spider Man acts like Spider Man in the expected ways. <laughs> right, and oh, all the different animation styles are crazy. Spider Punk alone, just animating him, must have been a feat. Because he's basically like a walking collage, where his colors are never consistent, the style's always changing, it feels like he's crumpling up and then re-straightening himself back out. (laughs) It's just nuts! Yeah. So the fact that that- there's- the fact that that happens is just- this is a beautiful movie! Yeah, like, the, the the art style, is, in both the animation of the characters and in the background, the art style is beautiful. There's a couple very poignant scenes that involve, like, Gwen in particular, where you can tell the art department was, was just like, we are going to have the best time. <laughs> right, and it's so, co- and it's consistent from the previous movie, because from what we saw in her, in her flashbacks and what have you, in the last movie, her dimension's just colored like that. It's just all weird, pastel bleeding into each other type stuff. But it yeah. looks gorgeous. It looks amazing. And of course, as much as I talk shit about all the other spiders in this movie that aren't Spider-Punk or Spider-Man India or Mayday, gotta give it up. Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Miles Morales. Great. Oh, he's great. He is wonderful in this movie. I feel like in this movie, even though he like fully takes up the mantle at the end of the first movie, in this movie, by the halfway portion of the movie... He truly becomes Spider-Man. I'd say by I'd say by the start, he's basically Spider-Man because he's already got the get it over your head with stupid shit, make mm-hmm. stupid jokes, <laughs> realize you're in over your head, save the day anyway. Yeah, exactly. Kind of. For me, it's also a thing of like fully owning, or at least to the knowledge and information that he has available at the time, fully owning his role in everything that's going on. Yeah. Okay, and uh, you know what, just because I've covered most of the other major spiders in here except for him, Mm -hmm. how I feel about Spider-Man 2099 is going to depend heavily on what the next movie does. Yes. (laughs) Which sucks. Which sucks, even though Oscar Isaac does a great job. No, he does. Because, I mean, he's Oscar Isaac. The only time he does a bad job is when he's given nothing to work with, stares at X-Men Apocalypse. Yeah, and... It's especially a thing of, like, he's painted as a very, like, serious character, and his character is 
incredibly serious, but there are still various glimpses of, okay, yeah, he's still Peter Parker, or, well, not. He's not, but. He's, st- he's not, but you know what I mean. No, like, he's but. He's still, I, he still I like has glimpses that, of being Spider-Man. I like that he's serious, because the thing is, that's something that a lot of adaptations of Spider-Man 2099 don't really get. He is not a jokester. He is, mm-hmm. actually, he's a reversal of Peter Parker Spider-Man, essentially, where outside of the suit, He's a snarky asshole. In the suit, he's pretty much all business. Yeah. One of my favorite bits is from the, was it post-Secret Wars? I can't remember if it was post-Secret Wars or pre-Secret Wars. The point is, there was a point where Spider-Man 2099 was stuck in the present-day Marvel Universe, which, technically calling it present-day isn't quite right, because his future is an alternate timeline anyway, I think. The point Mm -hmm. is, he was stuck in the main Marvel Universe, and he rescues somebody, and she goes, Thanks. Who are you? I'm (laughs) Spider-Man. No, you're not. I've seen Spider-Man. Your build is different. Plus, I've seen the two of you together. Plus, you're not cracking jokes. We want a joke? Fine. A priest, a nun, and a rabbi all walk into a bar. You'd think one of them would have seen it coming. There. You happy? I'm Spider-Man. <laughs> and I like that. I like that he's not... Like, Don't get me wrong, I love a good Spider-Man, haha, funny man, never shuts up. But mm-hmm. the change in dynamic is interesting, and it just feels like a lot of the times he loses that because it's generally understood Spider-Man is a jokester, and therefore all Spider-Man are jokesters. Yeah. Which ties in quite nicely to where this movie is going, and I can't wait to get into that. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm missing something big. I mean, I say because we're still in the non-spoiler section. Yeah. <laughs> I'm amazed. I feel like we've done pretty good at not spoiling anything for the most part. Or at least not spoiling anything, like, super major. Yeah, nothing that wouldn't already be evident from what's in... Like, readily available. Yeah. Yeah. I, we've been keeping it general. I like that. Yeah. Well, well done us. <laughs> I can't think of anything. I'm sure there's something big, too, but I just can't think of anything. Hmm. Well, well, if it comes to us later, I mean, I think we covered it pretty dang well. So, yeah. in short, definitely go see it. It's 100% worth it. It is so worth it. It's like, regardless of whatever issues that we have slash we'll get into in a bit, it's still an extremely good time. 100%. So, with that being said, if you don't want to get spoiled on Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, make sure to click away in 3, 2, 1. I don't believe in consistency. <laughs> it's like no no stop spider punk i feel personally attacked by that statement <laughs> okay you know what i already mm-hmm. liked spider punk well enough and then i a- after the movie i realized what his whole gimmick was and it took me a bit to catch up mm-hmm. and it's that he keeps spouting this inconsistent fuck the establishment rhetoric just so nobody takes him seriously all the while, he's sowing seeds of dissent in people about the organization and stealing tech from them so he can assemble his own watch so he doesn't need them. <laughs> Which he then gives to Gwen. By the way, I quit. Yes. <laughs> God, he's so great. <laughs> okay, so what happens is, it turns out Miles didn't actually create the spot, but the spot was responsible for bringing the spider that bit Miles, which is apparently from another universe. Before you get too much farther, are we going to acknowledge the absolutely ass backwards but still r- well pulled off retcon about the spot's origin? Yes. As to how... <laughs> so it also turns out he gained his powers when Miles stopped the super collider and it exploded. Hmm. Or was it when Spider-Man... Or was it when the first Spider-Man stopped it? I think it was supposed to be when the first Spider-Man stopped it. Right, never mind, I was, I got mixed up. So, mm. point is, he blames Miles for what happened to him. No, wait, because Miles threw a bagel at him, and he was yeah, still Miles normal. Threw... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it had to have Which... been, so it had to have been the second super collider explosion. Mm-hmm. Not the one with the first Peter. Right. Okay, timeline straight, no, no anomalies, <laughs> all canon events secured. Fuck, I hate that. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, god, that's... That's one of those, oh, I guess we'll get into that. You're probably going to be able to better get into that than I can. Okay, yeah. (laughs) So, the spot basically wants revenge because he feels like everything's been taken away from him. And part of what sets him off is that Miles both doesn't know and also Mm -hmm. doesn't... Like, take him seriously. Doesn't take him seriously, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, the spot ends up realizing he can use his powers to jump between dimensions, which starts causing a bunch of problems for the Spider Society, 
Right, Gwen shows up, immediately rips open a collectible. <laughs> She's like, oh, I had one of these too. Why do you still keep it in the package? And she rips it open. I think not just you and me, I'm pretty sure our collective theater did a total gasp. <laughs> oh, disgusting. That just... immediately put Gwen on my enemy list. <laughs> What was funny is that you looked at it with a smile and said, it's like, I fucking hate Gwen now. <laughs> yeah, no, because you don't do that. And you know you what? You don't do that. <laughs> you know what? I wonder if maybe she was trying to get Miles annoyed at her. Uh, uh, since oh, she wasn't not. planning on coming back. Mm. It might have been a, uh, hey, look, I'm not great at all. I'm actually a fucking gremlin. You should totally, <laughs> you should totally forget about me. You should totally not care about me anymore. <laughs> oh, I forgot to say anything about about Jessica Drew, but to be fair, I feel like she's not really in the movie all that much. And mm. she's pretty much just a Miguel 2.0. Right. And also, and I'm gonna point out here, I hate the idea that she's fighting crime while visibly pregnant. I know I don't have a horse in this race because, you know, I can't get pregnant, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's not the... You shouldn't be actively fighting crime. Yeah. I feel like. I don't know. You do you. Let me know in the comments. Am I am I an asshole? Is that an asshole opinion? For me, it's like a thing like, okay, you shouldn't be fighting cl- crime while pregnant. You definitely shouldn't be fighting crime while also using your motorcycle as your main weapon while very clearly heavily pregnant. <laughs> also true. So, you know, yeah, no, I'm genuinely curious because that bugs the piss out of me and I don't know if that's unreasonable or not. So, mm. please, advise me. <laughs> Tell me if I need to overcome some deep-seated bias. Right. Anyways, the whole thing about the Spider Society is, apparently, there are, this is what they're actually called in the movie, canon events that like are meant- Like C-A-N-O-N. Yep. That are meant to happen in, a, in, in, in all Spider-Man's existences. Like, for example, death of an uncle, losing mm-hmm. a police captain who you're close to in some way, shape, or form. Presumably the death of Gwen Stacy, or in Gwen's case, Peter Parker is one of them. Yeah. And that these are all necessary, or the universe is going to collapse, and also the universes really shouldn't intermingle, because if they do, it's going to collapse. I feel like that whole plot thread is like a commentary on comic book writing. <sighs> yeah. So, <laughs> no, see, what what I like about that is that they're clearly setting up for a big giant deconstruction, I hope, of, no, Spider-Man's life does not have to be all misery, because I'm sick of it. Yeah. I just want a Spider-Man movie where, like, nothing tragic happens at the end. <laughs> or during it. Right. Like, you can have stakes. You just, yeah. You just don't need to kill Gwen or Uncle Ben or Aunt May or whoever the fuck. You just don't. Or Harry. It doesn't need to happen. Or Gwen's dad. And he doesn't need to be in some... He doesn't need to be in some soap opera relationship where they all suck at communicating because you have to manufacture cheap drama because otherwise Mm. Spider-Man is married and God knows you can't have that! (laughs) So I like this setup because I know they're going to subvert it. At least I hope they're going to subvert it. Maybe I'm giving them too much credit. It is still Sony. But Mm. the part that I hate is the fact that pretty much every Spider-Man in the society, and there are, again, hundreds of them, seems to have accepted this. Yeah, like, that's the bit that killed me, was because Miguel O'Hara goes over the canon events, and it's like, this event has to happen for every Spider-Man, because if this doesn't happen, basically crazy shit happens with the spot, and he creates a, basically a natural disaster within the respective No, universe. allegedly, I don't even think it was the spot. Miguel seems convinced that that's just what happens. Oh, okay. Because the whole thing that kickstarted his crusade is, he found a universe where his counterpart had died, so he stepped in because his counterpart had a family, and he was having a good life, and then something happened, and when we see that universe disappearing, it doesn't look like it had anything to do with the spot. Hmm. The effects are different. True. So he's now convinced that deviating from canon events will lead to the destruction of a multiverse, but, and I'll get into this a bit later, we know that's not the case, necessarily. Mm Mm-hmm. So... It's a case, but the part that bugs me about this is that this requires me to accept that these hundreds of spider people have all accepted that they just need to sit back and let a bunch of tragedies unfold because it's crucial to their story. Which doesn't work because Spider-Man's whole thing, I mean, granted, you're more familiar with that than I am, but Spider-Man's whole thing is like, even if the odds are aren't the greatest, 
do it anyway because your whole the whole thing is trying to save as many people as possible. Yeah, and obviously because this is dimension hopping, there's some overlap with time travel potentially. So I'm not saying like if something's already happened, mm. they're not Spider Man's not necessarily the one to go back and try to change it. But right. the thing that kicks off Miguel being pissed at Miles and Miles getting into the society headquarters in the first place to talk about it is apparently a canon event was supposed to unfold in Spider-Man India's universe while Gwen, Spider-Punk, Spider-Man India, and Miles are chasing the spot. Mm-hmm. And Miles manages to avert it from happening. Yeah, which, which is what one does. <laughs> yeah. So Gwen would try to stop him. So apparently she's on board with just letting this play out. Mm. It, it just bugs me that it's like, this is not a hypothetical past event. This isn't saying like, oh, you can't go back in time and kill Hitler because if you do that, it's going to have drastic consequences in time. It's a, this is a thing that is happening now. And yeah. I'm just supposed to trust that the universe has arbitrarily decided this suffering is supposed to happen? No self-respecting Spider-Man is going to do that. Yeah, no. So that part really makes me fucking mad because it just feels honestly like kind of character assassination. It's a bit disingenuous. You could have, and not, not to rewrite the whole movie, but I feel like you could have done something where you could still have Miles in conflict with the Spider Society where, for example, I don't know, he finds out that something is going on or finds out Spot's going after his dad, but the other spiders want to contain him because of something anomalous going on, so it becomes a fight of him against them over that. Hmm. You didn't have to turn it into they're all a bunch of mopey sad sacks who are willing to let people die because the universe said so. <laughs> I mean, Peter Parker's not Reed Richards, but they're all pretty smart. Yeah. You, are none of them looking into this? Have none of them determined that this can't be how it works? Because another big twist that happens is, like I said earlier, turns out Miles' spider came from another dimension. It was brought when the Kingpin activated the Super Collider the first time. And apparently, yeah. that spider was supposed to bite that uni- the universe that it originally came from somebody else and make them Spider-Man. So because it bit Miles instead, that, according to Miguel at least, led to Miles' universe Peter Parker dying, and led to the universe that that spider was originally from not having a Spider-Man. So, those sound like two pretty big canon events getting disrupted. Crazy how both those universes are still there! God, it's it's such a shame because after going through that and all that, I was like, that actually sounds really interesting though. <laughs> Yeah, it's just a problem. This movie, the problem is the movie is taking too long to set up pulling back the curtain. Yeah, and and it's annoying in that aspect too because the movie already pulls back the curtain for a split second and then tries to pretend, oh, but you didn't see it. It's like, no, you showed what was behind the curtain Yeah, and you already told us about what was behind the curtain earlier. If they didn't have, because, um, is it jumping ahead to get to going to how... Miles goes, air quotes, back to his universe. No, I, I think we could do that. Yeah, so basically it turns out that Miles finds out that the canon event in his universe is at least very heavily implied is his dad actually dying because he is a captain, which, God, I hate that. Right. <laughs> it's it's one of, like, I don't hate the idea of it, but the way it, like, goes over, it's like everyone has a dead captain. It's It just sounds like something that it's like, we have to phrase it like this so that people get it. Yeah. And it just, it sounds like talking down, and I kind of hate that, but that's neither here nor there. So he fights all of the spider people within the spider society, which in itself is really cool. In a vacuum, that whole sequence, that whole admittedly very long sequence, is very cool and very fun to watch. He gets back to the headquarters, activates the machine that normally sends the bad guys back to the dimension they're, they're supposed to go to. Because it uses their DNA, which is a very important point, because yes, Miles, the fact that the spider is from an alternate universe has altered Miles' DNA, and this is the thing where... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 that's fine, because it's like, that's kind of what I was going to get into. It's like, he's thinking, I've got to go back to my universe or 1610 to get back to my dad but when the, he gets scanned by the machine it pops up says earth 42 which would be fine if it didn't say that in a bright yellow screen for like half a second and then the movie spins its wheels for another five to ten minutes after miles escapes the spider society headquarters where it keeps building up building up building up now gwen's in 
Miles' home dimension looking for him, and it's building up to this big reunion, and Miles is talking with his mom, confessing that he's Spider-Man, and the whole time I'm just sitting there, twiddling my fingers, going, yep, come on, yep, come on, yeah. come on, you already gave it away, come on, come on, come on, and then his mom just goes, who's Spider-Man? Ah, ah, there it is! Fuck! <laughs> yeah. It... See, now, the unfortunate thing is that I feel like it still would have been extremely easy to figure out relatively quickly, like, into his conversation with his mom. But I feel like by having it pop up with Earth-42 and the send back to Universe machine, it takes away a lot of the impact of what's happening. Because it's like, again, they talk about it, they show it, they literally show what's behind the curtain. So it's like, as that's playing out, I'm like... Oh, man, why did you tell us? And I feel, you know, the even more baffling part is, in a weird way, I feel like if the movie had ended there, Mm. it actually would have been worth it. And they could have kept it exactly as is, even with the dead giveaway. Yeah. But it keeps going for another, like, 15 minutes. Mm Mm-hmm. Where then it's Miles kind of sort of adjusting to this new world, but not really, where his uncle is alive, but his dad is dead. And also, it turns out, Alternate universe, Earth 42 Miles is actually the Prowler, which, okay, that was good. I like that a lot. Looking forward to seeing where that goes. And then it's also I, I, got, oh, sorry. No, as I say, I actually have a slight problem with that. Really? <laughs> yes, because when it's revealed that Earth 42 Miles is the Prowler, our Miles is just like, I just, I just want to get home, man. I don't really want to be here. And Prowler Miles is like, and why would I help you do that? And it's like, because he doesn't want to be here. <laughs> like, he's very clearly communicated, hey, I have no business being here. I don't really want to be here. I just want to get back to my world so I can save my dad. And it's like, yeah, help him do that. If he's gone, you can go back to whatever villainy thing you're doing. So when Prowler Miles goes, why would I do that? It's like, why wouldn't you? Well, that's assuming you can trust him <laughs> to begin with. And I don't blame him for being skeptical. A guy shows up with your face pretending to be you. Hmm. Mm, that's fair. If you're a criminal, I ain't gonna trust that shit. <laughs> Just saying. That's fair. But the movie keeps going with that, and it keeps going with, like, Gwen back on her world because she got kicked out of the Spider Society because she didn't stop Miles from getting away or something, or because she brought yeah. him in in the first place, and... She's been avoiding going home the whole time because her dad just found out she was Spider-Woman and still tried to arrest her because he's a shit dad and also a cop, but... (laughs) Damn. Lay it on thick, why don't you? (laughs) Then it turns out he quit afterward, Mm -hmm. and he's no longer a captain, which, oh, I guess means averts the fucking canon event because he's not a captain anymore, and I guess his whole shit is based on complete semantics. Fuck. So... Uh... (laughs) Gwen ends up assembling her own team to try to find Miles and I guess do something about the society or whatever, and it's it's her, it's Spider-Man India, Spider-Punk, mm-hmm. Spider-Bite, the virtual, the VR avatar Spider-Woman. Yeah. And then the returning characters from Into the Spider-Verse, so Peter B. Parker ends up joining up with her, Noir's back, Ham's back, Penny Parker's back, great, cool, yeah. I love it. I mean, hmm, I don't know, like, the whole... While I did not enjoy the movie spinning its wheels during that whole, like, last bit, I do kind of want to give a slight pass to her talking about her de- to her dad about everything. If for no other reason, then that would be an extremely sucky, like, plot thread to not go back on. And I'm kind of glad that they went back on it and had the conversation they did, where at that point, her dad's face is just like, man, I, I don't really care anymore. It, none of this was worth it if I don't have you around. Oh, I don't think it was bad to keep the conversation. I think, I just feel like, and this could be a thing where maybe Beyond the Spider-Verse is three hours long and they didn't have time for it. But I feel mm. like everything from the point where Miles realizes he's not actually home up until the actual end of the movie could have just been done in Beyond the Spider-Verse. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. And going, hmm. I would agree to that. I would probably appreciate a mix of... God, it's hard to say because I did kind of like... Even though my problem of Prowler not helping bugged me, I did kind of like the reveal of that Earth Smiles being Prowler, but I also feel like that could have been saved for the very beginning of the next movie. Mm. You know, like, I feel like where you said when he's talking to his Earth 42 mom and she just goes, who's Spider-Man? And you just see, like, the look of bis- disbelief on his face. That probably would have been a good point to, like, just have it go fade to black and just cut straight to the credits. Yeah. 
so ugh, I don't know. Right, turns out writing movies is hard. No, it definitely <laughs> um, is. And this is all just opinion. And again, yeah. again, cannot state enough. I love most of this movie. Yeah, it's for me what all of this boils down to because all of the things that we've kind of complained about in this bit have the things that happened in the last like what half hour of the movie, forty five minutes of the movie. I'd say the like back that. half because that's where the yeah. canon event stuff really starts kicking in. Yeah. There, this is one of those things, and I'm kind of speaking on my own personal opinion at this point. This movie is such a weird enigma for me personally because of all of this. I still, I like the movie. I like the movie a lot. I think the movie is good, primarily because even in this last half with all this crazy stuff, it's one of those things where there are so many, like, really, really, really good ideas that are being thrown out. There's very few, like, bad or stupid ideas being brought forth a lot of stuff here is really cool has a lot of potential it makes sense it is would love to see more of but the execution is god awful <laughs> but normally bad execution equals bad movie no you know what i'd reverse that i'd say the execution of most of these ideas is really good the problem is there's just a couple of fundamentally off things but those mm. things are such structural components of what they're doing that it's hard to just separate them out. Mm. Again, me feeling like all the Spider-Men are out of character. That's a big deal. Because the whole there's a whole bit of, you were never meant to be Spider-Man, you're a mistake. Which is poignant because he's, as far as we can tell, the only Miles Morales in the Spider-Society. And this is very much intended as a take that against everybody who has a problem with Miles being Spider-Man out of universe. I like that. Mm. It shouldn't be coming from the other Spider-Man. Yeah, no. That is such a giant fucking problem. And you can't... Like, you you could fix it. I think it would be relatively easy. But you didn't. So, it permeates through the whole thing. Like, the execution of this is really good. And I still feel properly bad for Miles and mad at the other Spider-Man, especially because it turns out Gwen and Peter B. Parker already knew and apparently just didn't tell him. Which, Which hurt a lot. <laughs> fuck! That was painful. But I don't want to be mad at them. I want to be mad at the guy. It's, it's the same problem as when characters make bad decisions in comics. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make you... When they do it real. When they do it badly, it does... Or what is especially egregious, it doesn't make you mad at the character. It makes you mad at the writers. Because you know <laughs> this is not an organic decision. You know right. it's being manufactured to cause conflict. And you know that it's not how the character would act. So, that's the problem. So I'd say, no, the execution of these ideas is really, really, actually really good. And this is really crazy to say, it's just a bad fucking idea. Mm. And I say that like, it's not a well poisoner, it's just a... Oh, there's mayo on this burger. This was almost perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm glad I'm I am not alone in the no mayo on burger. Absolutely uh, not. Love. What kind of fucking yeah. asshole? <laughs> yeah, for real. What kind of sociopath? <laughs> I went on a rant there. I'm sorry. No, it's fine because I. Hmm. I mean, I I I can see where you're coming from, and I, and I do understand your your pro thought there. I can see like how the execution of it is very good and there's bad ideas because what I was tr referencing in the mostly not stupid ideas, the big one, of course, being how for all of this to happen, all the Peter Parkers and spider people have to not act like Peter Parkers and spider people, which is very unfortunate, but it's also one of those things where it's clearly a major, major catalyst for everything else to happen. Mm. So it's like, it's a, it's like bad but you also can't have everything else that happens without that, which can probably still go in the category of bad writing. True. Yeah, I don't know. The, the most frustrating thing about this whole thing remains that I will not be able to offer a full opinion on Across the Spider-Verse until Beyond the Spider-Verse comes out, and that in and of itself, pretty big sin of movie going. Yes. But... And also with everything going on, it's is it set when the next one's supposed to come out anyway? March. <laughs> Okay. So less than a year, to their credit. Mm. Allegedly. We'll see what happens. Yes. Uh, let's see. Positive things, because I feel like I've been on too much of an angry tirade for a movie I actually really like. So, for me, it's a thing of, really liked it, even though it pissed me off, just because it's the whole thing of, like, 
can dish it out but can't take it. The mass dad jokes when they enter the spy- the spider society. I was just like, oh, shut the fuck up, movie. <laughs> yeah, just uh, anybody else got a clever comment? Oh, yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, shut up. But it's also thinking, like, I do that so much more now, especially at work. Where, man, this is the whole thing of dishing it out but can't take it, isn't it? <laughs> so many of these cameos are fun. Earth 67 Spider-Man. Perfect. Mm. When he's just Remind slowly me. the the anime the the old animated one the one who starts web streaming oh, and Miles okay. like I can do everything he can do and then Miles just swings right past him oh good one again even though it is absolutely more than likely nothing but fan service but the bringing in of not just the various comic book Spider Man but the couple of the video game Spider Man and the pre MCU live action Spider Man in like the references to like Uncle Ben dying or their respective captains dying actually really cool wasn't. Kind of one of those things where it's like part of my brain was going, they might do that, but I don't see them doing that. And it's like, oh, of course they do that. But granted, Sony also owns the rights to those movies to begin with. So right. Might as well. Still really cool to see. Okay, the greatest cameo in this movie. Mm. Donald Glover. Yes! I can't believe I forgot about as that. As live action Prowler. Which is funny because the first time we see Donald Glover in anything is actually within the MCU as itself. Because he plays, even though he's not expressly called the Prowler, he is Miles' uncle in the first Spider-Man movie. Funny enough, when when Peter's pulling up, like, his digital rap sheet, that alias Mm. is on the list. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So, apparently he is the Prowler. I don't know if this is the one from the MCU or a variant of him, because we Mm. never saw him suit up. Yeah, you know what's funny is that I was thinking, when they were introducing the whole thing of how... There's all these villains or whatever that came from other dimensions. I did think to myself, it'd be really cool if Donald Glover showed up. Because we, <laughs> haven't, because we haven't seen or heard anything about him in, in the Marvel in a hot minute. And then he shows up in the Prowler costumes like, a. It's also fitting because he was a big inspiration for the creation of Miles Morales to begin with. Oh, was he? Yeah, because I, I believe with the Amazing Spider-Man, there was a pretty big campaign for him to be Peter Parker. Oh, okay. I mean, I know he voiced Miles in, like, the, what, 2015 animated series? I think so. Yeah, but I didn't know that he was, like, part of the inspiration for Miles to even exist. Yeah, at least I think that's how it went. Hmm. So that was crazy. Yeah. No, I like so much of it. Peter parked car. (laughs) I did, like, like a minor thing, but it just reminded me of it. It only happens a couple of times, which, honestly, a couple of times is probably enough. But I did, like, the couple, like, pop-up blurbs where they're explaining a couple, like, comic book Okay, yeah, the editor's notes. We need more of those. We just need those in comic book movies in general. Yeah, that's that was really cool. That was a really cool thing. And it's like, huh. (laughs) Have When a character pops back up, like, they bring Helen Cho back, and then all of a sudden a a box pops up. Check out Avengers Age of Ultron if you don't remember her true believers. (laughs) 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 These are all fun. A lot of these are just costumes that spider-man wore in the comics but still Mm. cool and presumably there would be alternate universes where he's still wearing those costumes bagman was there right i don't know if it's a good thing or just horrifically callous but it's like after they spend so much time talking about how everyone has a uncle ben or a captain who dies and the whole thing of like miles trying to escape the spider-verse starts they cut to the scene of spider-man in therapy with spider-man and going and I just looked over and over and was like, oh, let me guess. He, he died. died. And I was just like, man, that's really cal- a callous joke to have, considering what was just talked about, like, not even ten minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. No, that felt that felt very irreverent. Yes, but still funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's still kind of funny. Still, it's very edgy. You know what? I've been downplaying the family dynamic in this, or at least not talked about it as much, but it's a, it's a core tenet of this movie. The whole first oh, yeah. half is dedicated to fleshing out Miles' relationship with his parents and how that's not really working out because he won't tell them he's Spider-Man, because he's afraid that it'll change their relationship or that they won't love him, I guess, which... Yeah. You know what? Reasonable, especially because the movie literally opens with Gwen's dad finding out she's Spider-Woman and pulling a gun on her. Yeah, and, like, trying to arrest her. Yeah, and I also enjoyed how, even though the parents aren't aware their son is Spider-Man, they do at least have the wherewithal to go, you know, our son needs to grow up, but we probably do need to as well. Mm. So it clearly shows, it's like, you know, they understand that he is a human and he is trying to do big things, especially with, like, how it's shown at the very, like, beginning of the movie when they're having the parent-teacher conference about how 
Miles wants to go to Princeton to study, to study quantum physics. Yeah. And his mom and all that are like, no, but that's too far away. It's like, New yes, Jersey but... is too far from Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was just like, I mean, he's out of line, but he's correct. <laughs> As, a, as but, an objective observer with no skin in the game. He needs to get off his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he get off his ass. Excuse me? <laughs> he's, he's having a talk with his dad while he's Lost. in the spider costume so his dad doesn't know it's him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that um, was really good. But like the whole family dynamic is great and it's done in such a loving way and it's done in a, such a loving way where you understand no one is being more of a dick right Every, everyone's being like equally dickish but you also understand that in their dickishness everyone is also being very equally loving in their aspect everyone like, is trying their best and it's just yeah because it's like miles is clearly not happy and not proud of the fact that he's been having to hide who he is from his parents even if it is out of fear well, meanwhile, his parents, especially his mother, is, like, trying to come to terms with the thing of, you know, obviously you want to do these big things, and I want you to be, do these big things and be happy, but I have spent so much time with you and raising you and teaching you and all that, that I can't get used to getting older and seeing my child grow up, and I feel like I'm being left behind. And it's like, even though I'm not a parent, it's still so poignant, you know, it's things that have, even though, to get, I guess, a little bit personal, it's things that I've thought about in my relationship to my mom. Because it's like, even though our relationship isn't, like, to that level, per se, it's still the thought of, like, you know, both of us are getting older. These wonderful, sweet times that we have with each other are getting and going to get fewer and farther between. Shit. Yeah, so it's like, the re and that's just the reality of living and being human and all that. So it's one of those things where, when they get into that, it's just like... Oh, that's so sweet. But I also, and it's like, and it's very understanding where all of that is coming from. Yeah. And it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel like phoned in or anything. It feels legit. Because like you said, everyone here is trying their damnedest. Right. No, I, I like, I like where they're going with this a lot. That part I'm very much looking forward to. I hope Jefferson lives. Because he died in the PS4 game. Sorry, spoilers for, uh. Did he now? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the original I don't have one, a not the new one, not Miles Morales. Okay, I was going to say, I don't have a PS4. So I don't feel as bad, because, <laughs> let's be real, you were never going to play that one. I don't have a PS4, and I have no desire to give a PS4, because Sony decides not to have backwards compatibility on the PS4. Yep. Uh. Some, other, some other observations, including some, some favorite lines that I wrote down. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in comedy. Just kidding. <laughs> it's like, what is that? Oh, what's a, a what's metaphor a, for capitalism? Capitalism, <laughs> and then Gwen, I and I imagine she just didn't catch like what he said because she just goes, "It's something worse than that." <laughs> He's a little hard to understand sometimes. I'll admit. Yeah, he is. This is where the British stole all our stuff. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> that was really good. It's like, damn. <laughs> I feel like that's the one of the adult jokes in a mostly kids movie. Like, yeah. I don't know if I would call this expressly a kids movie. But I get the feeling that it's supposed to be one of the, if you're an adult, you should understand what he's saying kind of joke. <laughs> also, uh, one last one, I think, from me. And this this I wrote right at the start of the movie. after Because mm -hmm. it opens with Gwen trying to stop what she thinks is the vulture. Turns out it's a vulture from another universe. And then she gets involved with all the Spider-Verse society shit. So I wrote, mm -hmm. and just like the comics, Spider-Gwen's interest in canon gets co-opted by multiverse shit. <laughs> Because that is exactly what happened. They introduced mm. her for Spider-Verse, she was a hit, they gave her her own series set in her universe, and then they progressively just kept drawing her more and more in a 616 shit to the point where she had a 2019 series that was about her basically going to college in 616 because everybody in her dimension knows her identity because they were more interested on focusing on her interacting with other Spider-People than telling her own story. So! Oh, that sucks. <laughs> swings and roundabouts, here we go, there it is! Mm, I took Just the fucking going. shot. <laughs> uh, let's see, let's see. I think that's about all I had. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that pops up that pops up in my head. No, I mean, it's I mean, again our own issues and bitching aside. Even though it's a lot of fundamental stuff, this movie's really good. No, it 
if this wasn't a really good movie, I'd hate it. Yeah. <laughs> As it stands, it is still a really good movie. I just don't think it's better than the first one because it's got those underlying problems. Hmm. But again, we'll see. Beyond the Spider-Verse can't fix it. I want to make yeah. that clear. No matter how good Beyond the Spider-Verse is, it doesn't change those problems in this movie. But it can make the trilogy as a whole something genuinely, fuck me, spectacular. <laughs> I couldn't think but, of um, a better... I couldn't think of a better... <laughs> but I'm flip. I couldn't think of a better adjective, alright? Hmm. I, I didn't want to do it, but I did it. The only final thing I can say is that it will be an absolute crime if they don't get Nicolas Cage back to play a noir Spider-Man. Oh, they fucking better. They fucking better. <laughs> I will come to their houses, and I will shave <laughs> their cats. <laughs> I will come to their houses, steal their kid's bike, and yell very aggressively as the kid as I make off with their bike. That, too. <laughs> I will drink egg creams and punch Nazis. <laughs> I will insert myself into Bram Stoker's Dracula. I will make a movie about myself as an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> the the end result is, this is still absolutely worth checking out. It is 100% worth seeing. With that being said, let's look at next week, where I'm pretty sure our one option is Transformers Rise of the Beasts. Oh god, uh, no. Oh, fuck. It could be worse. True. It could also be better. It's just very true. Who knows? Maybe this will be. I mean, maybe this will blow me out of the water like Bumblebee did because I was not expecting to enjoy Bumblebee, and I had a really good time. I mean, if there is any merciful thing, is that relative for Transformers movies, this one is supposed to be like I guess like mercifully short. Oh, good. Like it's less like it's less than two hours. Thank God. Yeah, last I checked, at least I'm not Robot sure. Robot punching like movies should not be longer than that. Yeah. Anyways, thanks so much for listening, everybody. I'm going to skip the spiel, because this is already running long, and we already did it in the middle of the episode, so you know what to do if you feel like doing it. Mm -hmm. In any case, this has been Under the Bridge with Cody, a.k.a. the Scarlet Troll. And with Greg, a.k.a. Greg. And we will catch you guys next week. Bye bye everybody. Bye! Pay your, pay fucking, your riders. fucking riders. <laughs> <laughs> I like how that's just become a sign-off now. Yes, indeed. Goodbye. Bye!